Okay, hello everyone. Sorry for some technical difficulties. Uh, welcome to the webinar, Tools and Strategies for Fostering a Civil Work Environment. Um, before we begin, just want to give a context for our presentation today. Uh, what we're here to talk about is what I refer to as everyday incivilities. I refer to these as the insidious, everyday, uncivil behaviors to which we are subjected in the workplace, but that are not always easy to regulate through traditional policies and procedural responses. These are often more pervasive in our workplace and they impact our daily lives more regularly than many other more egregious behaviors. I'll explain what I mean more about, about that later. Also, I'd like to just give a context to uh, why this issue I think is important, why I'm here to talk about it. First of all, my background, I've been in human resources for a number of years. I am a lawyer, been involved in civil rights, um, employment discrimination issues, and so forth. Also done a lot of teaching and instruction on these sort of things. And based on that experience, I've observed a number of things. One is that institutions really seem to struggle a lot on this whole issue of how to manage these everyday types of incivilities. It seems that they tend to go one of two ways in the response, and neither of which are effective or appropriate. On one hand, there's a tendency to overregulate. Um, they sometimes apply draconian command and control processes to handle these everyday incivilities, when the nature of these incivilities aren't always as egregious as the overregulation in the existing policy would warrant. So that's one problem, but then on the other extreme is actually perhaps more prevalent is that or institutions sometimes look at these kind of issues, they find there's no real policy or procedure that really works for these kind of issues, and they abdicate responsibility for responding to them. And again, neither of these approaches are effective or appropriate. And I think perhaps there's other ways we can look at these issues. Um, I think the best way would be, um, frankly, would be are there processes that uh, individuals can use to, what I talk, talk about is self-regulating themselves basically relying on common sense and good judgment um, instead of formal procedures whenever possible to handle these un uncivil behaviors. So I'll talk more about that and I hope you find value in this presentation. Quickly, let me talk about what the learning objectives are. We want to talk about uh, basically what, uh, you know, the, why we need to focus on this issue of incivility, workplace incivility. We want to spend some time defining civility and incivility in the workplace examine basic uncivil workplace behaviors, and explore a different approach for responding to civil behaviors. Again, some approaches that uh, don't always rely on policy and that don't advocate responsibility to have some responses that, as I again refer to them as self-regulatory responses. And then finally, we want to spend a little time talking. Okay. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, reviewing broader institutional strategies for fostering workplace civility. All right, so as we begin this, this presentation, uh, some of you out there may be thinking about, well, I think this is an issue in my workplace, um, in my institution. I think we need to focus on it, but I'm not sure leadership is always appreciative. How can I make good arguments? And so some of the things that I'm sharing here may help us make that argument. Basically, um, one thing we want to look at is as current management practices. You know, I read, I've read a number of books on these issues. Uh, I certainly love Stephen Covey, Peter Drucker, and others on these issues. And I know Stephen Covey, in a book called The Eighth Habit, has referred to the industrial age model for managing um, the workplace. And basically, that's the whole process of what were referred to as command and control practices, where basically the boss is in charge, employees are clearly a subordinate, there's really little opportunity for creativity or offering input or doing anything other than what the boss commands. Things have changed over time. Uh, there's certainly a lot more competition, technological advances, and basically we're in a place where it's, there's a more inclusive participatory pra practices going on in the workplace. Yet I think a lot of institutions still rely on those command and control industrial age processes. And I think implied in that is the fact that, um, you know, there wasn't this call for civility in those relationships. You did what you're expected to do, and perhaps we just sort of expected that's the way things were. Yet we're more expected to collaborate more and to uh, work more independently. And I think that, that calls for a more respectful civil workplace. It was never appropriate in the first place to have these approaches, but certainly there's a call now with more inclusive participatory practices. Another impact is uh, on women and minorities. Uh, over the, uh, with, with all the changes in the past 50 years with the employment laws, discrimination laws, and so forth, there may be an expectation or a feeling among some people that we don't really need to focus on these issues of discrimination as much anymore. Hasn't it kind of gone away? 
Most of us know better that that's not true. But what has happened is perhaps some of these behaviors have, which were formerly overt, in other words, I could say to your face, I'm not hiring you because you're a woman or whatever, have become more covert. And uh, there's a lot of behaviors that are these are covert practices, um, subtle, subtle behaviors that can really feel discriminatory. They're hard to put a handle on, um, but they can, they're really a basic, a lot of incivilities. And so if we can take care of this, some of these issues in terms of how women and minorities feel in the workplace, uh, we can be more effective in, in responding to those issues. So again, that's an issue we might want to focus on. Another, th another process we might want to think about, another issue, is what we call the broken windows theory. Basically, um, these are unattended, that unattended incivilities can escalate if they're not taken care of. Uh, I'm borrowing this a little bit from uh, Rudy Giuliani, who wrote the book Leadership, former mayor of, of New York. And they applied this issue of broken windows to, to, the, to their city. And basically, the idea there was if we take care of the graffiti artists, the turnstile jumpers, the squeegee men, and so forth, we might take care of the bigger for crimes and send the message that, you know, a broken window here, if we fix it, larger criminals are not welcome here. And cannot the same kind of approach in terms of smaller issues, these basic incivilities, taking care of that, will we not send the message that issues like sex harassment, workplace violence, uh, bullying, and all that are also not welcome? And so there might be some aspect there to think about. And then another reference that I, I refer to often in these conversations is uh, the Cost of Bad Behavior, How Incivility is Damaging Your Business, and What to Do About It. Written by Christine Porath, Porath and Christy, Christine Pearson. And in their studies, uh, they come up with a lot of impacts and really dollar cost impacts of unattended incivilities. Rudeness that's not addressed. And among the statistics are what you see on the screen. In a survey, respondents experiencing rudeness, 48% um, of those respondents decrease their work effort. 80% lost time worrying about the incident, 63% lost, lost time avoiding the offender, and on and on and on. And, and really, in, the in that book, they talk about actual dollar costs that you could calculate in terms of lost productivity and other impacts, lost reputation by not attending to these issues. All right, briefly, let me talk about when we, what I think about when we think about civility. You could look at dis dictionary definitions of these issues. Um, and certainly people have written about civility in a lot of context. And we'll find, I think, a lot of these things represented. Certainly, I think we could expect in any definition issues of respect, courtesy, and politeness. And that's all true when we think about a civil work environment. But I, I want to emphasize that when we think about civility, it's much more than just manners. It's also issues of, of, of good citizenship in the workplace. Are we building a good community? And fundamentally, when we talk about a civil workplace, um, are we building skills and practicing these things? Are we looking at our civil discourse, discourse and how we interact in terms of interpersonal communication? Is all that going well? Are we doing those things? So these are things to think about broadly as we think about a civil organization. So this is one look at un civil workplace behaviors. One definition I'm going to kind of point to a little bit as we think about the uncivil workplace behaviors in our workforce. There are other definitions, but this is one that I rely on a lot. Basically, from these authors, it's low-intensity deviant behaviors with ambiguous intent to harm the target in violation of workplace norms for mutual respect. So let's break this down just a little bit. First of all, in terms of low-intensity, Basically, when we talk about issues like bullying, uh, workplace violence, sexual harassment, those are a little bit higher intensity. They're certainly important. They're certainly uncivil. But some of these everyday incivilities are, are, have less intensity. And that may sound innocent enough, I suppose, but they're also harder to define. They're also harder to get a handle on because of that low intensity. And they're harder for targets of the incivility to really say, hey, I really am being impacted by this. I need help. And so that makes it even trickier when we think about these kind of issues. Clearly, any other any kind of uncivil behavior, even the bullying, of course, sexual harassment, and so forth, is deviant behavior. If it violates organizational norms, it's a deviant behavior. So that's part of that definition. And just really pointing it out again in terms of this issue of ambiguous intent to harm the target, when we talk about issues of sexual harassment and bullying, the intent is often more clear, uh, less ambiguous in terms of what's intended in terms of a target. When we talk about everyday incivilities, that's not always the case. That um, sometimes when someone is, is presented with they've been uncivil, been told they've been uncivil, they sometimes re respond saying, well, I didn't realize this, or I didn't really mean to be rude, I was just in a hurry, 
or oh, so and so is just hypersensitive, and not acknowledging that their behavior in any way impacted others, and the intent again is not as clear. With bullying, again, it would be a little more clear in many contexts. And clearly, any of these kind of behaviors would be in violation of workplace norms for mutual respect. Let me quickly go through some of the uncivil behaviors that I think are important. This is by no means an exhaustive list. One thing is these what I call in passive incivilities, the kind of things what, that we don't do. We don't say good morning. We don't say please. We don't open a door for someone. Not something that we would uh, write someone up about or discipline necessarily, but certainly uh, an issue that impacts us if someone routinely is behaving this way and not acknowledging our presence. Subtle disrespect is an issue. Nonverbal and paraverbal messages. We kind of know this when we see it, when we feel it. Nonverbal, of course, is the body language, the facial expressions, the head nods. Paraverbal would be the sighs, the groans, the, the, and those sort of things, the eye rolls. Certainly, we're clear. We, we're, we see them when, we see it, when we're in a meeting and other places. We, we know it when we feel it in terms of this subtle disrespect. Again, oh, not always easy to get a handle on. There's no question that when we talk about issues of etiquette and common courtesy, uh, that's part of the civil discourse as well. It's part of, part of uncivil behaviors when we're not behaving that way. You know, the manners of address, um, coming to meetings on time, turning off electronic devices, and those sort of things. That's the kind of things we talk about in terms of common etiquette issues. And then let's not, of course, undermine, uh, undervalue um, the impact of pet peeves, you know, the microwave issues, the coffee machine issues, and so forth, the things that really can drive us crazy in terms of what our coworkers are doing. Gossip is clearly an issue when we think about uncivil behaviors. Um, one definition is water cooler talk about absent third parties. What you say, um, can what you say behind my back, can you say it in front of me? And that's the basic idea there. Now, gossip takes a lot, a lot of different forms than just that. And of course, in the worst case, it can lead to def defamatory comments, um, perhaps even legal action. General rudeness is just all over the place, and you see some, some definitions there. Um, some of this gets a little more clear in terms of the intent of, of what's being said, but again, clearly an issue of uncivil behavior in different forms. We can undervalue um, the impact of inappropriate electronic communication. Uh, that's certainly getting a bigger, bigger issue now that we're relying on technology more and more. I think perhaps the younger generations get blamed a little more for this, but it really applies to all of us in terms of those kind of behaviors. And then verbally abusive behaviors get, get, get really intense at times. Foul language, the use of labels, calling someone lazy, stupid, or whatever. Accusations, harsh tone, and those sort of things. Clearly, these are aspects of uncivil behavior as well, things that are of concern. Now, in this final list uh, of uncivil behaviors, um, some of these issues really have um, policy and procedure that, that define some of it. So not all of it is um, a matter of just our common sense. There's clearly policy. But there's a lot of gray area in some of these issues. So, for example, privacy and ethical violations, you know, there will be policy on, on confidential and proprietary information and use of that, uh, conflicts of interest, ghost employment, and so forth. But there's even things like, you know, telling white lies, you know, the, the boss asking the secretary to lie for them that they're not here, um, using the Internet um, for personal reasons uh, during work time, and all kinds of other things that um, some policies exist, sometimes not. And certain things can obviously st stretch into clearly uncivil behaviors, uh, inappropriate behaviors. Now, we have a lot of laws in terms of anti-discrimination and harassment, in terms of uh, those kind of issues. So when we talk about culturally insensitive behaviors and harassment, sometimes these are st issues that are first-time incidents or issues where um, the intent is less clear. And the point of this is that besides just relying on policy, there may be other ways to address the behavior, to correct behavior, and move on from there. And so there's a lot of borderline issues between policy and things that uh, we can take care of up front. And again, bullying is a serious issue. I'm not talking as much about bullying per se in this conversation, uh, but you know, if we can sort of cut that off at the pass a little bit in terms of bullying behaviors so that it doesn't get repeated, that's not always easy, of course, then there's areas where, where we can cover that, not just reliance on policy. And the point here is that these are behaviors that involve different matters of degree, are not opportunities to address some of these situations before they escalate. You know, learning opportunities, providing counseling, and so forth. So there's a theme here that I, I see when we look at some of these uncivil behaviors, these everyday incivilities. Um, traditional policy and procedural remedies are just not always going to be effective in addressing these sort of issues. Um, and is there not some other way? 
some other remedies that are available that would be more effective. Obviously, I'm implying that there are, so let's look at this a little bit. First of all, just a little bit of conversation about typical responses that people have or, or institutions have to bad behavior. Um, these are some a list of things that, you know, we, maybe some of us listening today can think about these things and how we're impacted when, when there's bad behavior going on. And I'm not under, undervaluing these things in the right place. There's sometimes this over-reliance on policy procedures to address specific offenses. And that may be fine for more egregious offenses, but when we talk about um, these everyday incivilities, it's kind of hard to define or detect sometimes. Therefore, it's hard to write policy in everything, and it'd be an exhaustive, pointless process. And very difficult always to point out a policy that applies to these kind of behaviors. We can certainly look at progressive discipline, but again, those are more effective um, often with more egregious behaviors, but it's also difficult to apply discipline to in a consistent manner. And it can lead to very harsh results, and for some of these everyday civilities, it's sometimes hard to, to apply that consistently and fairly, um, particularly when the, 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 the impact is less severe and couldn't be corrected some other way. Certainly managers get frustrated with bad behavior, may rely on negative ratings and performance reviews and remarks. Sometimes it could be something happened in the course of the year, you said this, you did that, and suddenly that's a, a bad mark for the entire year. Again, not a good way to look at this issue. And of course, there's always the right for people to file complaints and to get that looked into, but really formal investigator, investigatory processes really lead to, uh, often lead to win-lose outcomes. They're not satisfying results to really resolve relationships and, and, and improve things. So again, the theme here is sort of a reliance on policy and procedure. And if that's all we do in terms of these, these issues, if that's all we're doing, it sort of leads to an enforcement mentality versus looking deeper at relationship issues and what's going on there. And it begs the question, as you see there, is civility enforceable? Or is there not some other way to look at these issues? All right, you may laugh at this, but I've tried to think about a way that best describes when I think about the balance between applying rules just for every situation and really doing nothing um, because there doesn't appear to be a policy that can, can apply. So I'm relying on Goldilocks, as you'll see here. And we know the fairy tale. And certainly in terms of Goldilocks and the three bears um, entering the, uh, the bear's house and among other things, finding one bed too hard, one bed too soft, and then finding that bed that was just right. So it just seemed an intuitive way for me to explain this. So in one extreme, we're, we're applying rules for everything when it does, there's no real policy that really applies directly. And if we're doing that, we're becoming too punitive and responding to some of these everyday incivilities. The worst, a worst case can be because there's no policy, anything goes and therefore we become too permissive. And so my argument and my suggestion is that we look at common sense and good judgment, use our common sense and good judgment um, to use what I refer to as self-regulatory responses. And it's finding a proper balance between the rules and doing nothing. Can we not do those things and, 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 and minimize the impacts of too much regulation and too little by doing these things? So that's the whole concept when I think about enforcing civility, so to speak, using this Goldilocks principle. So let me talk a little bit about what some of these responses um, are that we can think about. Again, to avoid those extremes that I've just described. Now this may sound counterintuitive, but we could actually do nothing. And when I say that in a conscious way, we could decide to do nothing if we see some basic lower level types of behaviors that are correcting themselves. You know, parties are in a dispute, they're arguing, but they're working out among themselves as a manager should I intervene. Perhaps not as long as we're moving forward from that point. Just momentary lapses. Someone's having a bad day and says something, does something, didn't say good morning or whatever. Well, let it go. Just do nothing and things will improve, or we hope. But if not, we look at some other approach. Why can't teams look at house rules as a, as a process? Certainly when we think about mom and dad, them, them sending the house rules, you know, clean up after yourself and so forth, that seems to be effective. Why can't we look at teams to do that? Now it could be when we do that, we. Um, and teams work on that in terms of a written process, but often these things would be more implicit, just more ingrained as we live and work together. We understand the basic rules of behavior. And we, we use this as a gentle way of reminding each other to hold one another accountable. So at a conscious look at, as teams look at this in terms of house rules. Now this one, next, next item may take just a little bit of explaining, um, but as it says, impose appropriate social consequences. Now I have a definition that I use for social consequences. 
It's an immediate message. Um, a social consequence is an immediate message you receive from others in your community, conveyed implicitly or explicitly, communicating that an action or behavior in which you have just engaged is socially unacceptable and rightly met with social disapproval. Now, it's in a team setting, and this may connect with the house rules I've just described. You know, there's these spontaneous, naturally occurring types of situations. And you can see the examples at the bottom of this screen. You know, someone tells an off-color joke, and it's not met with any humor versus awkward silence. Um, there's a refusal of a teammate to talk about, to gossip about a, a, a third party not in the room, to refuse to do that. And there's a lot of other levels of this. They just occur, and they send a message, and perhaps momentary embarrassment, that, oh, I, I said this, I did that, maybe it's not working in this team, I need to think differently about telling an off-color joke again, and so forth. So it's just one way to look at it. I want to use caution here, though. This should never be used as a matter of ostracizing a, a coworker. Um, if someone really is correcting your behavior, it's not a matter of completely eliminating from team interaction as much as you know, they work through it, they're part of the team, we embrace them, and think about that. So we do use care in how we might think about social consequences in this regard. Okay, moving a little further in terms of just the deeper levels of support and, and issues that we might need to deal with are the issue of offering support and counsel to help a person change their behavior. This, of course, would apply to a manager, um, a leader in, in, in er various aspects in doing that, uh, you know, pulling the employee aside, pointing out the issue, offering alternative approaches of how to respond differently, how to not be rude, how to, to not be uncivil or to react to someone else's uncivil behavior, reinforcing belief that they can certainly do the work. But I think also, colleague to colleague, we can do this at some level. Obviously, a manager, if things don't improve, could look to discipline. A coworker wouldn't. But the idea is, can we have those kind of conversations and do more of that to work with employees and avoid discipline whenever possible? Another approach, of course, is confronting behavior in a supportive manner and insisting on change. So this just ups the ante a little bit from the prior, prior comment. You know, behavior is not changed. We need to confront someone directly. A manager would do this, but I think as colleague to colleague in the appropriate context, we'd also do this. And just say, you know, this happened. This is the impact. Um, I was offended. It needs to change. But we do it in a way that the person may listen to us. We do it in a way that avoids um, their defensiveness as best possible. It's hard to hear these messages and to do it in a way that we're not being threatening or pushy. We are being assertive. We're trying to help the person. There's a lot of models out there when we think about supportive communication, supportive confrontation. One that I rely on um, is crucial conversations, tools for talking when stakes are high. Just those kind of models are helpful to have these kind of conversations to correct behavior. And again, avoiding discipline and other harsh outcomes if we can. All right, hopefully in organizations, there is some process um, that we can seek help from the manager or at least we should hope, hopefully look at institutions and help organizations develop their managers to be, be available to help employees through that. Certainly part of the manager toolkit and their training should be about how to coach employees. Well, specifically, they should work with employees to address situations that are uncivil, that are conflict situations. Now, the more ideal approach is can we help an employee address their own situation? You know, we coach them, but then they go back to deal with the situation on their own. But of course, the manager has an obligation at times to intervene when necessary to address these situations. So that'll be important as well. And then moving from there, can we also not look at an organization to sort of seek third party support, to seek counsel um, and, and mediation? Can we not have or, uh, an organizational process by which um, there's things like in-house mediators that we develop or, or coaching um, and helping employees support one another that way? At IEPUI, we actually are looking a little bit at this whole peer mediation model and trying to get people at different levels to think about how they mediate or how they help situations. And I want to be clear here, these are the mediation processes that help in the relationship, help support communication process and so forth. They're not the transactional outcomes that we expect in the legal environment. So there's a clear difference in terms of how we look at, at this kind of approach. But can we not look at this more intensely in terms of how we we encourage people to seek third-party support and how we're actually responsive in providing that support in different ways. And I'll give you some examples in that. All right, so if we're doing all these things, just uh, this is sort of illustrates sort of a, how we achieve that balance that I was referring to, being not too hard, not too soft, um, not too 
being not too permissive, not too punitive, and those sort of things. Can we achieve a balance where we think about the severity of behavior in question and have the appropriate response? So as you think about these kind of self-regulatory responses I've just described, can we think about um, the best, best response for whatever the issue is? So as an example, you know, someone didn't say good morning and there's these issues going on for a time being, unless things really continue that way and the job involves, you know, customer service and those sort of things and routinely if someone is not being friendly, doesn't have a good affect, we might do nothing. Let it go. This person might correct. And if not, of course, we might take a different approach. Gossip gets a little more serious, and if we feel like someone's gossiping or someone is gossiping and should be counseled a little bit, we address it privately. Don't embarrass them. Address it. Say, we just don't gossip this way. Let's, let's, let's change how we behave. Foul language, of course, is a little more severe, so, of course, we might confront it more, more promptly. That supportive confrontation process that I talked about and so forth. And then culture and senses remarks. Now, it may depend on what the remark is, but the idea here is that Rather than uh, looking at the non-discrimination policies or quickly running to that, if something's said, it's insensitive, it certainly needs to be addressed, um, but can be corrected and worked through, um, can we not address it promptly? And it may involve a, another level of training or coaching. I want to be clear, not sensitivity training. That's sort of, I don't think, appropriate, but certainly some kind of training that helps people get skills, think differently about how they, what they say, how they communicate with others, um, how they think about you know, diversity issues and so forth. So again, different levels of response depending on what the issue is. And thinking that way in terms of the appropriate self-relegatory response as I've described. All right, I do want to spend a, a little time here on uh, sort of an interim step before I talk about organizational strategies um, that we might want to consider. Basically, um, I was thinking about some of the questions that came in um, prior to the webinar. And I know that there's situations out there that seem hopeless that seem kind of impossible. And I realize that some of the things I've just shared as an organizational approach may not apply to you. And there may be people listening who say, well, this isn't my organization. No one's, you know, they're not really caring about this issue. I feel on my own. I don't know what to do. And I understand that. And I know it's very frustrating. So I don't pretend to even have all the answers here now or to say that the answers are even that easy. But I do want to offer some, some, some thoughts as you think about those situations, as you navigate them and work through them. Basically, the first thing is don't be a victim. Um, this is sort of some of the teaching in terms of the bully, uh, bullying training, bullying um, information research. It's a difference between the word victim and target. And as a victim, it's that mentality of maybe blaming yourself, uh, feeling that you have no choices when in fact you do, I'm not saying they're easy choices, versus that you are being targeted. In fact, it could be your target because you're actually doing good work and someone is jealous. There's some literature out there that kind of, kind of suggests that a little bit. So that's one thing to think about. Don't be that victim. Don't play that victim. Know that it's not your fault. One thing is, even though it's frustrating maybe going to HR, it's hard to go to the institution at times, do, do what you can to create awareness of your concerns. Don't be silent because, again, that works against you or can. So how can you create awareness uh, among trusted colleagues, appropriate individuals, your manager, have those conversations to create awareness that this is going on. Maybe there's not a quick result, but it's going on. Can you build a network around you, build support around your issue? Can you find ways to talk about it and, and go through conversations that way? That's going to be important, too, as you think about these issues. And as you do that, and as you get colleagues to help you or a network built around you and, and, and people to support you, um, what, what can you do to strategize the best approach? These things are not get corrected over, overnight, although we wish it would. It's frustrating. I know it, it's an endurance test sometimes. But the idea is, can you strategize what the best approach is for responding to these issues? What will you do next, the next time you, enter, you have to engage with this person? Um, what will you say? If you decide to confront that person, what will, how will you do that? What coaching will you get before you would, would do that? Talking it through. Having, a, having a, a game plan in terms of your next step, the next thing you would do. Strategize. Um, that will be important. In the meantime, of course, um, you may want to think about managing your interactions with the uncivil person. Um, again, this applies also to the bully. Um, but the idea here is, you know, there are necessary meetings you have to go to, necessary interactions and those sort of things. But not everything necessarily requires face-to-face -face interaction. Maybe there's emails instead of that. Or other ways to think about how can I manage that interaction um, when, when I can. 
It's important, too, to remain objective, to be realistic, to manage your expectations. Um, emotion plays a part here, so don't want to minimize that. But I know that um, it's depending on who you're sharing your emotions with. Uh, emotions will only come out at different levels and should at, at some level. But, but you know, when you have to make your case in front of certain individuals, such as human resources, you want to be objective. You want to be clear that, you know, this is happening to me. I know what I'm speaking of. I know I'm mature here, and this is really going on, and I need to be believed and presenting that case accordingly. You do need to be realistic about the time frames, how quickly things are responded to, and how the, the process will work. And I know that can be very frustrating. And so you need to manage your expectations along the way in terms of how that would happen. And then finally, when we think about this is, you know, believe that re resolution is possible, that a better day is possible. In my work, I've certainly counseled and worked with employees in a lot of different situations and meeting over meeting and all that. There wasn't easy responses or quick, but over time, I always heard reports of finding that better situation. Now I'd hope that that's a better situation within your institution, but again, there are institutions doing good things and that you find that better day, that better opportunity elsewhere. Sometimes that will be a reality, but again, the hope is within your institution, we're addressing these things in a, in a, in a productive way. Again, I know these things uh, may not resonate with some in terms of their frustrations, but again, we need to think about how we process these issues and move forward. Okay, so in the remaining time, I want to talk a little bit about organizational strategies. I have three uh, to talk about it a little more in depth um, in a few in a more short, shorter fashion. So this again thinks about as an organization, how do we think about our workplace overall and creating a, a, a supportive civil work environment. So one is recruit a civil workforce. And by doing that, the institution needs to really think about creating sort of a having no tolerance for employees who can't model civility. Let's call it a no jerk rule. Now there is a book, it's written by Robert Sutton. He has a title that's similar to that, the no, similar to no jerk rule, but replace jerk with another word. It starts with A, and you get an idea of the kind of book he's talking about. But it has a lot of information in terms of how to think about the, the institution in terms of this kind of concept. And some of the points in that book, as well as the cost of bad behavior that I mentioned, as well as other literature, is the idea that we will not benefit if we ignore this basic premise, that there's, we have a no-jerk rule. We have the understanding of how we think about things. And so um, we, the hardest case, of course, is when the leader, the person in charge, is that jerk, and there's not an easy response on how we would manage that. But over time, can we, will we not see a, a diminished reputation we're talking about in the corporate setting, loss of profits, and all kinds of other things, and there are stories about this. The person in charge doesn't change their behavior, and there's diminished results as a result. And so those are things to think about. And also to note that there's sometimes this tolerance for the superstars. Well, their competence and their, their superstar characteristics are never, never outweigh um, the nastiness that we see. And so realizing that too, that that's an issue we need to, to understand here. So can we commit to that kind of premise as we look, about, look at our workforce and recruiting a workforce? So and part of the process, of course, is our selection standards. How do we think about that? So how do we think about leadership standards and citizenship standards? So I want to propose that we think broadly about this as well as narrowly. So when I say broadly, before we recruit anybody, um, what, what, are, what do we say as an institution in terms of our, of our standards or expectations for behavior, um, for citizenship, for leadership? And how is that written in handbooks, onboarding, and our training, and so forth? And are we consistent and uniform, applying it across the, across the culture and across positions? And I know that's a difficult situation. Certainly in higher ed, there's a lot of issues about that. But that's important. And even looking at managers, how are they being evaluated? And how are they looking at their, their staff, their team, and are evaluating managers on how they are ensuring that their team behaves civilly? And do we, do we have that expectation, expectation up front? When I say looking at this narrowly, so I'm talking about job by job, job description by job description, by posting by posting. In other words, for every position, these are not written into some basic understandings of civil behavior. That might not say it so much in civil or civility, but you know, customer service, interacting with a team, um, interpersonal skills, and I think there are ways you can be very behavioral in describing that. To be clear, these are the expectations. And I think it's all the more important when we think about leadership and, and leadership roles. It's clearly got it written in there, and maybe very specifically for those positions, what we mean by that as they lead teams, as they interact with the rest of the campus, and so forth. What, what is that? How is that spelled out? 
and are we looking at that clearly? Another thing is when we look at the actual search process itself, I think it's important that we think about search committees and, and search processes that involve more than the hiring manager. I think we do that a lot in terms of academic positions, and maybe not for every position in the workforce, but certainly for a lot of staff level positions as well, this would be important. It would be important to have multiple evaluators to look at the situation. And I think what's important here too is the idea that a lot of people in an evaluation process, particularly if they're a part of the team, are going to look for those technical proficiency issues. Can they do this job? And maybe they need sort of a broader perspective and maybe bringing in some from, someone from outside the team. Or maybe even someone from HR, your equity office, or a diversity advocacy office, whether to be part of a committee or to at least advise, to help us in our searches and help the hiring manager to think broadly about not just technical proficiency, but good character. So someone can say, you know, this person definitely has good skills and computers or whatever the job may be, but I'm not sure this person interacts very well with others. And can that be overcome? And if not, you might want to think about that candidate or rethink whether that's the right candidate for you. That kind of input would be important as we look at these issues in terms of our actual processes of interviewing, searches, um, forming committees, and so forth. And just a basic issue in terms of interviewing. There's a lot out there to think about, but one is looking at behavioral-based interviews. Now, you could Google this, and there would get a lot of stuff on there in terms of behavioral-based interviews, a lot of good information. So there's a lot of different models for this. But one that sort of I've used that I think is just very basic is asking a candidate, tell us a time when. You know, tell us a time when you had to handle a conflict. Tell us a time you had to handle an ethical challenge. Tell us a time when you had a difficult student to work with, customer, or what have you. What was that situation? Please describe it for us. What did you do to respond to that situation? What were the active things you did to deal with that situation? And what were the results of that? Now, that's different than a question such as, you know, are you a civil person? Well, of course I am. <laughs> that's a yes or no, and that's not going to get the information you need. So the more you can look at this sort of process and really honing in, and the more a, a candidate will, will respond to that, and be um, challenged by it, the more you might realize you find candidates that really reflect on these issues and get our good candidates. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about checking references. Um, there's a whole webinar you could attend on that somewhere. Um, but the idea here is if you've gone through your process of checking references and there's any niggling issue about uncivil behavior or potential for that, then pass on the candidate. It's not worth the time. All right, another quick strategy I want to talk about is including civility content into our training. So in two areas I want to look at, and that is one, compliance training and really minimizing managers' reliance on command and control and policy reactions and looking broader at how they look at compliance issues. And the other is a basic training in terms of employee skills. So here on the screen are some things in terms of compliance training to think about. Um, helping managers uh, in the training think distinguish between situations that involve policy and situations that may allow them to use those self-regulatory responses I talked about. And part of it is the next bullet where we talk about knowing when do I go to HR or other offices for help and when do I have some leeway? And when can we talk about the best approach that minimizes always a policy response? Again, some of these uncivil behaviors may implicate some of these co compliance issues, but they're, they're of a lesser degree that we want to avoid the discipline mm -hmm. if we can to have a better response. Perhaps some conversation about that broken windows concept, the idea that it's important as a manager, as a leader, that you look at some of these lesser, they're still serious, but lesser impacting civilities that are egregious, that are insidious, to minimize the more egregious behaviors and the potential for doing that. Any training course would include appropriate learning activities, not just rote lecture, role play, scenario discussion, and so forth. And the basic idea is getting managers to think about solutions rather than just strictly knee-jerk policy responses. And then we talk about just training employees in general um, in terms of civility content. We want to do more than just do's and don'ts and sensitivity training. Uh, we want to create awareness of the issues and help employees think about that and the importance of, of civil conduct, developing skills, and those sort of things. I think it's important to note that it's not about providing civility training per se as much as looking at different um, modules like conflict management, customer service, team building. And, and looking at those modules and saying, are we looking at these kind of civility principles and, and developing skills in that area? So it's not really a civility training per se as much as incorporating those kind of things in existing training. Scenario discussion is going to be important, problem solving, 
helping people through that in terms of our training, those are going to be important aspects of this as well. The final organizational strategy I'm going to talk about in a little depth here is uh, working with teams and ha having them talk about crucial civility issues on a consistent basis. So, so can we not help our managers to hold regular conversations with their, with their team members on these kind of issues? Um, help them review and discuss team house rules, um, as we talked about. Maybe the organization has a statement of civility in reviewing that. Obviously, reviewing on, from time to time non-discrimination, anti-harassment policies, vision and mission statements, customer service standards, and so forth. It could be a 10-minute conversation every meeting versus drawing it out uh, at, at length. But the idea is, can, do managers do these conversations? So constantly reinforcing these kind of behaviors and how we respond. And just to look more, a little more intensely on that would be this, this way you might, they might think about it. A manager might look at these issues before, they, before incidents actually arrive. Um, Generally, look at hypothetical situations. Prepare the team to think about where might we be challenged by these kind of issues, a difficult customer, a difficult coworker, and how would we respond? And the more we look at these hypotheticals, the more we're prepared to deal with it when the issues actually do arise. And then those conversations also look at the workplace environment. What's going on in our environment that we need to be attentive to to create a civil, respectful, welcoming environment? Obviously, a manager sometimes may have to stand in and, and deal with an incident as it's occurring. An employee struggling with a difficult customer, two coworkers are going at it, stepping in, addressing behavior, and then later, once the behavior is addressed, we might have to, we probably have to counsel that, those employees. Um, maybe it's discipline, but maybe there's other ways we look at it to ensure that these behaviors don't continue, and we learn from that. And then finally, can we not sort of have these after-incident review types of processes, as implied in the last bullet here? Um, can we have, have a sort of a review of what happened? And can we create a safe, non punitive learning environment where an employee can come in and say, you know, the other day I had this situation, I didn't know how to handle it, I may have blown it. I may have said this, I may have done that. Um, how do I do it differently? Help me through this. And creating an environment where that's okay versus always being resulting in punishment. And I think that'll be important as we create teams that are thinking about these kind of issues, good customer service, good civil interactions, uh, good helpful uh, interactions, whoever we're serving on the campus. All right, clearly I don't have time to talk about all the different strategies, but here's, here's three more just quickly to think about. So we talked about, uh, you know, recreating a civil workforce and talking about jerks. The reality is we will have jerks in the workplace, so we need to look at processes for managing those jerks and if things don't improve, to exit them. So that might be something to think more about. Some of the references I gave you talk more about those issues as well. Um, not much time to talk about it here, but one strategy we need to focus on. So we talked a lot about command and control processes, and are we, do we have processes in, in place that sort of, sort of bind us and require us to, to, to incorporate a policy or, or a response that is very command and control, very policy driven, simply because that's the way the policy is written, or that's been our practice, when in fact it can be very harmful if it's over-regulating and more punitive than we intended. So maybe we need to spend a time reviewing those processes and practices and policies to see if there's not more leeway in some of these issues. So that it's not tied into a, a knee-jerk response in reviewing that. And then as a final strategy would be the idea of building that, that workplace, being conflict capable. It's not just a matter of employees running to HR or other departments to get help. That's need there if it's needed, but can we build those skills in employees? I mentioned IEPUI, for example, the internal mediation training we're doing, internal mediators at different levels, peer mediation but also just a lot of things we can do to reinforce that, you know, I can help you in your conflict and coach you through that, but then you can go back and handle the situation on, on your own and helping them be more capable and thinking more intently about how we do that in our organizations. All right, for the purpose of the recording, I just want to preserve these references that I've relied on. They might be helpful for you to think about. And so I wanted to give a little time to questions, um, and I think really I've addressed some of that I had received. Um, so, so I just want to say this, that um, in terms of any additional questions, please do work through higher ed jobs. Um, and I'll be happy to respond. Um, they will forward to me any questions. I'm happy to engage you, however, that would be helpful to work through these situations. Um, so I do encourage you to do that. So finally, I do encourage you, of course, to rely on this conflict information to work through higher ed jobs, to get the support, to uh, 
obviously um, use the resource as, as you need to. I hope you have found this presentation to be helpful. I um, hope it's been engaging for you. Uh, we worked through the technology issues, so thank you so much for your time today. Um, I do hope you um, have a good day and look forward to engaging with you further if there's other questions as we um, conclude today. So thank you and uh, have a great day.